As long as the notebook saga continues. You see, most people can't afford to get a new smartphone every week. One of the milers of the simple thing in life. Okay, so the good news this week is that as opposed to last week, there are now only 57 weeks till Purim. Although, one would imagine that at this point we ought to focus on the 20 days till Pesach. But the truth is it's not a contradiction to think about the 20 days coming to Pesach and the 57 weeks until Purim. Someone told me that he was listening to the weather report on his way to the Shia and he heard that there was speed reduction on the bridges, high wind warnings, flood watches, certain coastal parts of New Jersey, they were told be ready to evacuate. And he says that, uh, sounds like my biography, he says. They should have just said life, because that's what my life is. You know, I never know what tomorrow is going to bring. It's full of high winds and flood watches, and I've got to be ready to evacuate at any time. I said, so is everyone else. If you learn to have the right kind of raincoat, uh, life goes on. He said, that sounds like my biography. Actually, he said, it sounds like my, my obituary, but I want to be a little more, <laughs> want to be a little more positive over here. In most of our lives, there, and there are issues with our speed, there are issues with high wind storms, there are issues with flood watches in different ways, and the need to always uh, be ready to evacuate and we're never quite sure what the snow rain line is, that's always the thing. And there are various aspects of our relationships that make things uh, far more complicated. Like who created the world wind chill factor, right? You want to get him. And uh, that's our biography. But for the most case, in most situations, by next year, usually it's resolved. Whatever, whatever you're thinking about now, right? The Mate of Frank was a major, major posek. He was also a, a, a very rich person, a refined Zalm Magolius, a banker, or a safer Mata Ephraim. And uh, once they were Purim in their house, a bunch of people were a little aggressive over there, and they had this vase, this very, very expensive vase, that came crashing to the ground, smash, crash, bang. And uh, his wife was naturally very upset. He was, like, pretty calm. And she was going after him. She said, how dare you be so calm? He said to her, well, I'm going to get just as angry as you are, but I have a minig that I get angry a year later. She said, really? Yeah. Okay, so she wrote down the yard site of the breaking of this vase. And she waited an entire year. And on the yard site, she came in and said, well, today you're supposed to be angry about the vase. So he said to her, tell me something, are you angry about the vase now? Or you're angry that I'm angry? He says, no, I'm, I'm uh, well, I, I, you're, you're really angry about the vase, or you're angry to see whether I'm angry or not? She says, no, she had a lot of other problems since the vase then. <laughs> so I said, you see? See why I only get angry about things a year later? Because by then it's not Nogaya. So he said, your father took me as a son-in-law because I had the name of an Uli. I, 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 I had a shem of being a genius. So I think fast. So I think a year ahead. So being that I know in a year from now I'm not going to be upset at this, so why should I be upset about it now? And waste a good year. And that's true in terms of controlling our anger. It really could be applied also in terms of controlling our anxiety, our anxiousness to a certain degree. In a year, whatever you're worried about now, whatever issue you're at a crossroad now, the chances are that in a year from now you will be facing different problems. You don't even remember these problems. So like, why, why waste, uh, just go straight there? So Be'emis, by, we hoped it's 57 weeks to Purim. So suppose I say to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please Hashem, give me a good Purim. And he's not up to Purim yet. I know, but if I told you now, you're going to be totally at ease next year Purim. So will you be worried now? So what, what's wrong with thinking ahead? And of course you can say the same thing, give me a good Pesach. Rabbi Nishalad. As a matter of fact, the Nesiva Shalom brings that that's a tremendous schooler in tefillah. Instead of just saying, Hashem, solve my parking ticket, solve my pink slip that I got today, solve the issue that's going on at home, say, Rabbi Shalom, please give me a good Shabbos. Say, Baruch Hu, please give me a good Pesach. 
So the mile over there is you're not telling the Rebbein Shalom how to solve the problem. It's never good to tell the Kodesh Baruch Hu how to solve problems. You're saying, Rebbein Shalom, my life is in your hands. The guy is, uh, Beryl borrows money from Shmerel, and uh, finally he says, where's the money? So Shmerel goes running to Yankel. The Yankel says, where's the money? Goes running to Shmerel. Where's the money? Goes running to Yankel. Where's the money? So finally he says to the two of them, listen, you two keep giving it to each other and leave me out of this, right? And the Rebbein Shalom kind of allows us to do that. The Rebbein Shalom says, listen, we're davening for a good Shabbos. We're davening uh, that whatever issue, whatever crossroad I am at this point, it should be solved by Shabbos. Now, how it should be solved, Rav Hashem, that's your issue. You know, that, that's... So the Vel says of art like this. My mother, Allah Hashem, used to say it. Something along these lines. Meklap, metrinkt, mekert, mepitz, melaint, metzailt, meklukt, meblust. I'll uh, give you a free translation. Okay? Um, we drink, sweep, clean, lean, count... Cry and blow. Yeah, what's this all about? What well, they say, this two, uh, two poor people were getting married, they said, what are we going to do? How are we going to pay for this chasana? So one of them said he has the tzitzes of the Rebbe of Melch. And the other one says he has the shoifer of the, uh, of, you know, of the Baal Shem Tev. They said, whoever's going to donate a hundred ruble to the wedding gets to blow the shoifer and kiss the tzitzes. So they did it, and they were able to pay off the entire wedding. And then the shatling came and said, what about me? <coughs> Well, I'm supposed to get paid too. They said, you know, here's the tzitzis, here's the shaykh, you can blow and kiss all you want. They said, <laughs> all day. So, what happens over here? So, we drink on Purim, we sweep and clean from after Purim till Pesach, we lean on the Seder, we count Svir Sa'imer, we cry the nine days in Tisha and then we blow shaykh. So, in a way, it was like, uh, this is life. Life is meklak, metrit, mekert, mepitz, melayt, you know, in the melat zechun, metzayot, mekluk, meblus. That's it. Drink, sweep, clean, lean, count. You know, cry and blow. That's it. Before you know it, uh, life is gone. Whip. I remember once when I was little, my rebbe was telling us a story. This is a story that uh, somebody came to the rebbe of Melach. They say the story about the marau, different legends. You know, King Richard, whoever he was, and uh, he warned him, you better do tshuva. And that night, all of a sudden, he's walking, and he's kidnapped, and he's overthrown by his government, and he runs through the woods, and he's in a water all alone, and he loses his whole malchus, and slowly he begins to work his way back as a woodchopper to a, to a plumber, to a mayor, to an officer, until he's king again, and he marries a new wife and children, and he starts his life all over again, and all of a sudden, there's a terrible storm, and they're drowning, and he wakes up, and he's frightened, and he comes back, and he's standing in front of the maral, and he says, whoa, I just went through a lifetime of what happened. And the morale shows him the clock was all one minute. This whole thing took place in one minute. So he said, you know, our lives are the same way. You look back at your lives. You say, where did it all go? When, when did I grow up? When did I get married? When did I have children? When did I raise children? And it changes so quickly. Somebody told me, an older person, that this is her reflections on Pesach. Yeah, what's, what's your reflection on Pesach? He says, when I was younger, I remember there was a whole tumult, which one of my brothers or sisters are coming. And then we would fight for my seat. Then I got married, it was between me and my husband. Your parents, my parents. Your parents, my parents. It was always an issue. Then when my kids got married, it was, what? You're not coming to us? You're going to your mechatanam? How dare you? You're there more than you're there by us. And then, like, you know, he says, now, Randy, I'm up to the point. I'm all alone on this world. You know, I go to this kid, and I go to that kid. And I'm saying, like, I felt, I felt my whole life was fighting Pesach. I said, you know, you could have gone through the world from a completely different perspective. So let's try to use Pesach as a barometer, and let's try to avoid that mistake. That our reflections of Pesach shouldn't just be fighting where we are and how we're doing it. Now, first of all, Purim and Pesach are inherently connected to each other. On Purim, we overdose on hamantash and marzipan's chocolate, those strange cigar cookies that pop up Purim and they disappear the rest of the year. You know, well, what happens to them the whole year? I don't know. And then we uh, ever wonder about that, right? And then, uh, right, so we're totally overdosed. You have like a week after Purim, kids bring boxes and boxes of wafers. And no one knows what to do with it. It's like, you know, the price of wafers crashes, you know. These kids that do business selling nash, they come after Purim with bags, and the other kid takes out his bags, and he goes, you know what to do with this, right? And then, all of a sudden, you're, in your house is packed. Every closet is packed with boxes of chocolate, and boxes of this, and boxes of that. And then starts the whole cleaning lady uh, crew, crews that start coming. They always say that Esther had seven, or right, seven maidens, one for each day. They said, how did Achishverosh not realize that she's Jewish if she came with seven cleaning ladies, right? How did that happen? <laughs> now, uh, 
So then starts this whole garachka, and all of a sudden, all the nash disappears from your house. And you always wonder, when does that happen? How come one day my nash closets are packed, potato chips, paco, you name it, and then it disappears? Where did it all go? Where did it all go? They're cleaning away. There's not a, and all of a sudden, we go from so much food that it's coming out of our ears, we're like, we're turning into one piece of chocolate, and your house becomes empty. And there's nothing to eat. The stove is taken apart. There's nothing to eat. And finally, there's one tuna sandwich that's being made. And you're told, ah, that's for the cleaning lady. Don't, don't go near that. Don't go near it. Thank you. Right? And uh, where, does, uh, where does life go? It's not really that bad. But uh, somebody told me that he was on a flight from Antwerp to America. And the plane experienced unbelievable turbulence. Not stop. It was like shaking uh, out of control to the point where they were thinking of, they told all the passengers to put their heads between, you know, in the front seat in front of them. And the crew was running back and forth, and he was sitting next to a from lady, and the lady was screaming that she's going to say Shema, she's going to give tzedakah, and finally at, at the point that it was shaking the most, they, were, they really thought the plane's going to rip them in half, she yelled, and I'm going to shear my cleaning lady, I promise, I promise, you know, at that point the cl- plane calmed down. <laughs> she reached the ultimate Messiah's Nefesh, she did it, okay? So when do we go, really, when do we go from before Purim to uh, starvation mode, right? Then the ladies are going to say, the men are complaining about the food. We're working 28 hours a day, right? And they're complaining about the food. And the guy, lady says to her husband, you know, help, help this, help that. Whatever he helps, he drops. Everything comes crashing down the, table, the things. He says, do me a favor, you know what? Help me. Leave the house. That's how you can help me. He leaves. He comes back a half hour later. <laughs> He says, you're back so soon. He says, how much could I help already? You know, like there's a limit that you can make me help. That, uh... <coughs> then you have these long lines by the hardware stores and by the takeouts. These unbelievably long lines. See, I think somebody should come up with a great idea. You should t- make, before Pesach, a hardware pizza store. <laughs> Put a mechitza down the middle and one line for both. Why should you have to wait three hours to get supper for your family, then wait another three hours to pick up one of those counter covers, you know, in one of those, uh, or duct tape or something? You should have one line, one long line, then when you get to the front of the line, you say, a plunger, uh, we need a new nutcracker, and a falafel, please. And the boxes should have like a machitza in them, well insulated, so it would come. I don't know why no one ever thinks about this. Okay. So uh, I, every year I say to myself that during the Purim time, during the Purim time period, you're going to put away, we're going to take Yosef at Sadik's Eitzah, we're going to take the seven years of, of, of fat, and we're going to put it away for the weeks of hunger, the, the seven years of hunger. We're going to take the food from Purim and put it away so there's food till Erev Pesach, and somehow it doesn't work, it disappears. I guess you have to be a Yosef at Sadik to uh, be able to put up with this. Um, you know the famous story that they say that there was a kid that said, I can't take the heat. So his mother took him into the kitchen, and she put up three pots. In one pot she put in a carrot, in the other pot she put in an egg, in the other pot coffee. And then she said, you see, three things react very differently. The carrot becomes soft. carrot becomes soft. The egg becomes tough, hard. And the coffee turns the whole pot of water into this with the right coffee, this fragrance that wakes everyone up. You know, wake up and smell the coffee. He said there's different ways how people react to heat. Some people become softer, some people become tough. And some people, they change the whole room. They turn everyone else into, a, into something uh, that is more gishmak. Now, what's important to understand is that as all this clapping, caring, silent bluesing is going on, that it's not the same every single year. It is not just a cycle of drinking, sweeping, cleaning, leaning, counting, crying, and blowing. Because there are other things going on in our lives every single year. Uh, it may be shiduchim, it may be health issues, it may be shalom bayis issues, it may be parnasi issues. It may be whatever, whatever is happening in the course of the nesiyoyness of life, tsar gidl banen, children, or rachman al lack of such. So each year when we're banging on Purim and drinking and sweeping, there, it's, it's in a combination with a bunch of different things that are happening, and that's why the no two Purims are alike, and no two Pesachs are alike. So when the Benoist Yisrael have an unbelievable Nasiris Nefesh to get the house ready for Pesach, it's never the same. You know, what's on your heart is never the same from one year to the next. So that's why the Schar for this Pesach will never ever be the, 
the schar you are going to get for cleaning this Pesach, for dealing with the frustrations, the ups and the downs, the family issues, the parnosa aspect of it, this Pesach, or just the schar of sitting here and trying to put yourself into a psychological mode, getting ready for a night of chayrus, will never ever be the same. Because what's going on in your life now is not what was going on last year, and it's not what's going on next year. So we say, when we get to that part of the Seder, some of us are still up, and uh, usually the little kids are. So take note, one of the things that we say in that pismen, of Ahi B'chatsi Alayla, we say, Sina Notar Agogi. Agogi Haman harbored this tremendous hatred. Because of Svarim Balayla, and he wrote his Svarim at night. He wrote his, his, uh, all of his Svarim that to destroy Rahman al your father and my father, your mother and my mother. And a Kaddish Baruch Hu, what did a Kaddish Baruch Hu do for us? Ayrata Nitzachacha Olav Vinodar Shnas Pura. And a Kaddish Baruch Hu generated the Nitzach and the victory over Haman by making Achashverosh stay up. By making him stay up. Now, as you know, in the year of Purim, they fasted. Uh, the three days fast took into account the Seder. So there was no Seder. They were fasting through the Seder. So it, there is a klal, says the Tver Shloima from the Arizal, where it says Melech. In the Megillah, the reference is to HaKadosh Baruch. It says Melech HaKashverosh, the reference is to HaKashverosh. So he teaches like this. That's the king. And the king that Rabbanu Shalom says, where's the, where's the Seder? Where are all those Melachim that are created? When a couple is about to walk into a house to the Seder and there are difficulties amongst themselves and they decide still after Yom that we're going to smile at each other. Where is that serious Nefesh of a father that comes down to the Seder and he is so broken, so worried and says, now is Yom Tev, I'm going to smile. The Rebbe says, where are those Malachim that are created by this mother that cried her way through a Yom Tiv in her bedroom and walked out and smiled to her kids and peeled the potatoes and cracked jokes and kept everyone's spirit up. Where are those Malachim? The Rebbe Hashem says, Yidna are fasting. And the Kaddish Baruch Hu said, bring the Sefer as a Chroinus. I want to see the Messiris Nefesh that Kalal Yisrael had throughout the years, throughout the years. Each Pesach is a different story. And the Rabbani Shem saw it, the Rabbani Shem says it's time to pay back this Chag. So it is not Bechinam, it is not for naught that the Heilig of Arditshava said, when we blow Shaifer, so it says the Malachim that are going to come out of, and it says the names, the Rashi Tevis of those Malachim, Kashrak, Tashrak, he says, you know what those Malachim are Rashi Tevois? They are Rashi Tevois. Kashrak means Karen, Shvenkin, Raden, Kratzen. Karen means to sweep, Shvenkin is to rinse, Raden is to rub, and Kuf is to Kratzen. So while you're laying there late at night and doing it again and, and scrubbing again and cleaning again, just know that the Malachim that you created now, they're the ones that are going to carry the Shoifer up there. That's the connection between Pesach and Rosh Hashanah. The simon of Atbash, you know that there is a simon, and each day of Yom Tov reflects a different day of the Yom Tov. First day of uh, Pesach is Tisha B'av, second day is Shuas, and so on. If there, uh, second day uh, Atbash, Aleph is the top. First day is Tisha B'av, right? Second day is Rosh Hashanah, second day of Pesach is always Rosh Hashanah, Gimel is Shin, is Shuas, and so on. The, all the Yom and Toivim are linked to Pesach. And the Rabbani Shalom says the schus of all the Yom Tovim depends on the Messiah's Nefesh that we have for Yom Tov. So I told you the story many times of these two Babas that are sitting there by Kiyah Shaifer, and they say, what's this Tashrak, Kashrak? Those are the angels that carry up the blowing of the Shaifer. What do these angels do all year? <laughs> well, I want this job, you know, these angels, she says. All year they guard the chant. All year they guard the chant. Yeah. You ever realize this? You put the chant up in the winter at 4 o'clock, and you eat the next day at 11, 12. Then in the summer you put it up at 8 o'clock. You eat the next day at 11, 12. So how, the chunk is on for another four hours. How come it doesn't burn? I never thought of that. There are special angels that guard the chunk. Really. And these are the angels of Kia Shoifer. Kashrak, Tashrak. These are the Malachim of Kia Shoifer. Who says they're the Malachim of Kia Shoifer? The other Baba says, what's with you? Tell me, when Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbos, do we blow Shoifer? No. Why not? Because the Malachim are busy watching the chunk. What's with you? <laughs> Says all of the Malachim. You know, the Malachim that are created now. 
by the courage of what it takes to care and shrink and rotten, you know. And you may be in a situation now and you're thinking, I'm scrubbing late at night, emptying out the refrigerator. You know, last year my matzah was A, but in this year, oh, they, 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 they. What I wouldn't give to be last year Pesach. You know what? Pesach is Pesach. The refrigerator has to be cleaned. Ah, you know what kind of malach am I going to carry up that shoifer when this goes on? Says the Chidah that there's a 30-day treatment period between Purim and Pesach. It's like a dropper. And imagine the doctor says one drop in your ears or one drop in your eyes. One drop for the next 30 days. There is a ruchniyistic, a spiritual kind of tahara that comes down to this world. And that particular <coughs> drop has to be mixed with, you know it says mixed, eat with food. Well that drop of tahara that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us from Purim until Pesach, that is mixed with whatever's going on in your life. And if you have the courage of doing what you have to do for Pesach, whether it's keeping the peace at home, whether it's, whether it's getting out there trying to cover the bills, or you're on your hands and knees scrubbing and sweeping, whatever you're doing, it's mixing with these drops. And the fact that there are other things that are going on in your life that is making it so difficult to be able to do this, that's the mix that Kalal Yisrael needs for the shoifer. So someone showed me, I don't know how many people have ever heard of Hideki Wantano. Hideki Wantano, anyone? No, he does not play third base or forward for the Brooklyn Nets. Or pitch. Or pitch, right. Hideki Wantano is a dentist in Japan. Yes, he's in Tokyo, and he's offering a very good half price on root canals. If anyone wants to go next week, no. He invented a pot. Don't ask me why him. He invented a pot that mixes by itself. In other words, there, there, there's like a plate in this pot, and it, when it reaches the boiling point, this plate starts spinning. Okay? So you don't have to mix it, and also it drains the fat automatically. Okay? So, sorry? It's going to start coming here, they said. In about Right now it's being sold and marketed in uh, Japan, and in a few weeks it's going to be copied in China, and then you know, it goes to then three weeks later, it's sold over here. That, that's how it's going to go. Right. The Bloomberg's probably going to answer it and say, because uh, we can't have mixing by ourselves. Right. It's too healthy. Right. And then the unions are going to stop it. The unions of uh, people that mix in restaurants are going to come. It's going to get more complicated here. But uh, this is the thing. You know, there are things in our life that mix, that mix by itself. We just have to go through it. We have to have the courage to go through it. Sam Saifer says, what's the difference between chametz and matzah? Chametz, when it gets the heat, it blows up. Matzah becomes more crispy. And that's very easy to say to someone else when he's going through a situation. But there is a kayach in Klal Yisrael to become more crispy. So the, this parasha begins by Yakel Moshe, that Moshe Rabbeinu gathered everyone together. It says in the Yal Kachmoni, Eilach HaParsha Shehizchel Vayakel, that this is the only parsha in the Torah, or the beginning of a sedra, that starts with the word Vayakel, and Moshe Rabbeinu was teaching Klal Yisrael about Shabbos, and that is Kadesh Yilmoi Doris Haboyim Lahakel Kehilois Velilmoi Hilcha Shabbos, and to learn Hilcha Shabbos. And the understanding is that this is the aside of the Tikkun of the Chet Egel in the previous parsha and Parsha's Kisisa. Because in what happened by the Chet Egel, there were a couple of moments of panic. Maisha's gone! We're all alone! We're in the Midbar! We're gone! We're finished! We're dead! Look! Look! There's Maisha! There's a meat! I see it! It's like we're doomed! We're, it's gone! It's a new world! God has nothing to do with this world! Or at least there's a separation between us and him. And that panic spread amongst Klal Yisrael. One, two, three, one, two, three. And we pay the price for that panic to this day. So the other way around, what do we do? We get together with a Muna, and that is getting together for Shabbos. That's Hashro and Hashlina. So Chazal Darshan Eila Hadvarim Ashetiv Hashem Lasis Oisam. That Eila is the Lamed Tes Melachis. Eila is Aleph is one, Lamed is thirty, Hey is five. Total. Let's see who's up here. Yes, plus the Hadvarim, the Hey of Hadvarim. Because it could have said Dvarim, it says Hadvarim. So those are the 39 Malachis that were given to Moshe Rabbeinu on Har Sinai. It says in the Tekune Zayar that the 39 Malachis are actually the 39 Klolais. Okay, I knew that all along when I was working for my boss. The 39 Klolais. Adam got 10, Chava got 10, and Menachash got 9. And the Morinayim explains in this week's Sedra that the Mishkan, where do we learn all the Lamites Malachis from? From the... Mishkan, looks like people are doing a lot of scrubbing here uh, the last couple of days. 
Hey guys, relax, take it easy. Close your eyes, don't worry, it's okay. This is what Shirim I made for. You know? I told you this once along, the guy's giving the Shir, and this man starts snoring, and the rabbi says, No, no. What? Down the clothes down. Rabbi, you started it, you finish it. Right, okay. <laughs> so the Mishkan is the Lamites Molochis. We learn all the Lamites Molochis from the Mishkan because it's connected. The Mishkan teaches us how to go through the qualities of life and to deal with it. And we've said when Adam Rishon sinned by the eagle, there was a concept of Shvira's Kalim. It's like imagine you cleaned and cleaned and cleaned, and also everything is turned over, spread all over the place, rolls down the mountain. And through the Lamites Molochis, we are being Mesach in that. al Tikri Benayach Ele Benayach. We're rebuilding what was destroyed by the Chet of by the Chet Eitzadas, put together by Matan Torah, destroyed again by the Chet Eagle. The Lamites Molochis correspond to the Lamites Klolois, and it also is the Tal. Tal, it says Tal Tchi. When Tchi Yisamesim is going to come, it's going to be the Dew of Life. Tal is also 39. That's Tal Torah, which is Mechayeyu. There is a Tal of Torah that corresponds to the Lamites Molochais, which also corresponds to the Lamites Makis. We'll try to put this uh, all together over here. The uh, Hechel Abracha brings from the Baal Tev, that's the Kermana, that every person is mechuyev to go through all the Lamites Molochais in the course of his life, not on Shabbos, during the week, in order to be Mesaka in the Chet of Adam Harisha. So what does that mean? They asked him, every person goes through all the Lama Tesmolochis, how many of us are going to be shearing and plowing, and, uh, and we kind of, it's hard enough to figure out the mission of Oirek, Shnei, Bote, Niren, Veniren, we're going to have to do it, you know, imagine I would be weaving, there would be one string going down Avenue L, another string going down East 15th Street, you know, all the way to Coney Island, the way, like we go through the Lama Tesmolochis, even baking and cooking, it's not exactly my, uh, I'm one of those guys that sent out of the house in order to help. <laughs> I remember once my mother was in the hospital, she needed rice. It was early Tisha B'Av morning, and then when I wake up, uh, my family that was always more uh, than happy to help out, I said, let, let me do it myself. So it's Tisha B'Av, 5 o'clock in the morning, I said, I'm going to, no restaurant is open. She needed rice, she was having treatments, she was having whatever. The doctor said she should have rice, so I'm, I'm going to cook it myself. So I took a pot, big pot, and I emptied, I figured, two boxes of rice into the pot, I put in water, and then I went to Davin. <laughs> You know what I mean about the Lama Tess uh, You know, it's like having rice in your basement, in your attic, coming out of your windows. Okay, it wasn't really that bad, but uh, Baruch Hashem, my family woke up when they, when they reached their knees, you know, so we better check this out. But, uh, you know, we, we don't do the Lama Tess Malachai, so most of us, uh, we don't have any shaykhs to it. So what does the Kermana mean for the Boshem to? Every person has to go through all the Lama Tess Malachai in order to be massacred the the chait of Adam Harishain. So the Hechel Abracha says, no, when you learn Hilchas Shabbos, you're Masak and all the Lama Tesmolachis. But being that Hilchas Shabbos is based on the Lama Tesmolachis, so in light, there's certain things we have to do. Whatever we do is based into one of the Lama Tesmolachis. Even the most sophisticated uh, <coughs> scientific, if it's not Boina or Saiser, if you're sending a rocket ship to the moon, I don't know, that's Haitzah, but it, 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 it's all in one of the Lama Tesmolachis, everything you do. <laughs> But you're, we're not doing everything, but through the limit of Hilcha Shabbos, you take into account, you're, you're turning all of Klala into a Paracha. His Lashon is when you learn Hilcha Shabbos, Naisel Maila Hayichod Kilu Oisik Bepoil. So you see, he doesn't understand this, Hideki Wantavo. That we, we, the Balabas, that stands there mixing the pot, Lakava Shabbos, you're going to take that away from her? Now, what does this mean? Let's try to put this in practical terms. That some of us have jobs, and we're very happy doing what we are supposed to be doing. Some of us have jobs, and people think that we're doing what we're supposed to be uh, doing. I just read someplace that they said the greatest waste of time in the American corporate uh, culture is meetings. Uh, so I can't tell you I'm in a meeting. What does that mean, I'm in a meeting? You know what it means when I'm in a meeting. Uh, they, they suggested, and I think we mentioned this last week, a meeting should only be 25 minutes, and people should be standing. This way, people will get right to the point. So this, this, this fellow tells me, tells me, a very, very good friend of mine, and he is one of the happiest people that I know. And what he does for a living is he drives a school bus. And uh, he was saying, he's getting on his years, and he's saying to me, you know, so happy I do what I do. And I said, why? So he said, because I have to always keep cheshbening. 
Uh, I get 15 notes every single day. Maishi's mother had a baby, he's going to his grandmother. It doesn't say who his grandmother is, I've got to think. His grandmother is, oh, oh, Mrs. So-and-so, right? You know, Shmuley, uh, oh, they're going, there's a wedding tonight, he's going to his uncle. Which uncle? I don't know. Which, which uncle? You know, Chaim or Aaron? Like, like, you know, okay, okay. Baruch, Baruch, the son was not well, he's going to his cousin. Can't be that cousin, because I know that cousin is going to your shlime. There must be this cousin. He says, I, I got to keep all this in my mind. And I Baruch Hashem drop off the kids in the right place. He goes, and I can't afford to be angry. You know, and I see, uh, you see first-time mothers putting their little kids on the big school bus, and like, you know, this big thing is swallowing them up. And calm down, mm-hmm. relax, don't worry, Baruch Hashem, we'll be okay, we will be fine. No, my shape, no worry, don't worry, mommy's, mommy's here, mommy's here. You know, the kids are bug off already, you know what I mean? Like, you know, kids are whacking everyone on the bus. <laughs> He's probably sitting there crying for me every minute, you know, little kids. I remember used to ride home the bus from the first day they, they had their stickers, you know. They tell them where they go, so one kid had his great idea. Everyone switched their stickers. <laughs> so let's play this game. Oh, great. Boom, 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 boom. You know, I was in the office rings. Wow, who's this kid that just came to me? I don't know. what they all oh, switch their stickers. Ah, you know, nightmare. It goes on. He goes, he says, I can't afford to, to fall down. Remember riding the bus in Yeshiva one day, used to 3 o'clock uh, rap, we came home, and there was a nice Russian uh, driver, Yitzhak, that was his name. He goes, What the Agmeder Yingle? He goes, With these not stick- Where's your sticker? He's gone, long gone. He goes, Who are you? He goes, I'm Maishi from Bar Park. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's Maishi from Bar Park. What's your problem, you know? Take him home. Could be only one out of 50,000. So he says to me, you know, now, Pete, some people go through a midlife crisis. I can't afford to go through a midlife crisis. He says, I got to smile every day. I, I have to really, you know, be ready, ready to bounce back. I said, you know, there's so much simcha in this person. I was just saying, somebody was telling me, you know, Purim was such a great time, because he was drinking a little bit and it brought out a lot of joy in him. And now he feels he'd like to get that joy. He says, I want, I want to say something to you, okay? And I, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and I definitely am not someone that pushes for drinking chas but I just want to bring something out. You were happy in Purim because you drank, right? Somebody else gets drunk and he goes smashing store windows. So how come you were happy and you were dancing? So the Territ says the simcha is in your heart. But there's a lot of blockages. So the drinking removed the blockages and the simcha came out. But the drinking on Purim should have showed you how, happy, how much happiness there really is in you. So there has to be another way besides drinking to re-get that simcha. To, to reach into that simcha that is in our hearts. So, Vayakel Moshe Kaladas Yisrael. Moshe gathers every single person together. And he says, Guy, people, kids grow up very, very fast. And you're not always going to be where you want to be. The father may not be where he wants to be. The mother may not be where he wants to be. The children, you're going to have to learn to deal with each other. Eila Hadvarim Ashatziva Hashem Lasai. So, all the Mepharshim asked the Kasha. If Moshe Rabbeinu just taught the Lama Tes Malachis, the Lama Tes Malachis are things that we cannot do on Shabbos. So why does it say, Eilad Varam HaShet Siva Hashem, Lasais Oisam? So says the Kermana, that's exactly the point. That on Shabbos, when we stay away from these Malachis, or even during the week when we learn Hilcha Shabbos, you are being masaking. The Indian of Zareya, Chayrish, Kaitzer, Ma'amer, and all of the Lamites Malachites that has to be. So, in other words, when you're learning the Lamites Malachites, you're in the Klaus of Adam Marishai, and when you accept your role in life, I may not be happy what I'm doing. I may not be happy what my spouse is doing. But I went to Rabbi Miller in his tape, The Ten Commandments of Marriage, which were quoted many times. He says, Your husband is a plumber, he's the best plumber that ever lived. He says, You know, it's, it's, it, one spouse can give the other spouse life, recognition, us. There's two kinds of oino, the word oino in the Torah, there's two isurim of oino. One is oino as mama, you fool somebody when it comes to money. Right? You go into a store, if you go into a store, and you say, uh, how much is that, how much is this, how much is that, that uh, Bentley, can I take it for a test drive, and you have no avamina of buying the car. So that is oino as mama, you're fooling the person. One of the reasons it's oino as mama, it's interesting, the Me'iri says, you go into a store, you say, how much is that diamond ring? 5,000. You walk out. You don't have enough buying, you're just cute. So the guy says, oh, they made the price is too much. Next guy comes in, how much is the diamond ring? He says, 4,000. You would just maps to that person $1,000. By not being honest with him. You can go into a store and say, I really have no intention of buying now, but uh, can you tell me how much this is? 
Maybe, so the guy's up to the guy if he wants to answer you or not. But if you allude to the fact that you're buying it and you really have no intent to buy it, you're just wasting the guy's time. You decided to have some entertainment over here. They should know that is a lav midraisa. The other kind of aino is aino as dvarim. Aino as dvarim is when you make fun of somebody. You say to, the Gemara says, you say to a balchuva, zachar mesecha, reshainim, remember what you used to do, <laughs> remember what you did, huh? Or you say to a ger, remember what your father did. Now, those are examples of Aino as dvarim. So why are they both called Aino? One is stealing money, one is embarrassing someone. So I want to marry the Gavar. Just like in Aino as Maman, I'm undercharging for, for something, right? I go into the store and I say, how much is this watch? Oh, five dollars. Five dollars. Walk out. You're laughing, you're laughing, right? And a bunch of kids were having a good time. They put this little on the corner. Right? They were selling these umbrellas or whatever, pocket stuff. They go, how, how much? How much is watch? Ten dollars. I take it for fifteen. No, 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 no. He's okay with the Chap, what he was saying. No, 50. Okay, I take it for 20. No, no. Wait, till he chap. What are you doing? You make me crazy. Yep, that's it. You got it. That's what we're doing, right? So, you know, it's Dwarim. You're causing pain. So, now, when you don't give someone the proper respect, it's also a no, because you're undervaluing a person. Oh, all you are is a bus driver, all you are is a plumber, all you are is a Rebbe, all you are is this, all you are is that. Great. You know, this is what I want. And you, you say that to a, one spouse, says that to, a, to another in such a way, and husbands unfortunately do it to wives, and wives do it to husbands, that's aina. It's like undercharging for something. You took something and you destroyed its value. And that person doesn't live up. You, and you take that person, on the other hand, and you give that person chizuk, you're giving him life. Don't worry, this is what you're doing. This is Mesiris Nefesh. Let's accept the fact that this is my job that I have now. That you're being masakin the lamites klolois. You're saying, Rabbi Hashem, this is what you gave me, then life is going to go on. There, there is such a chiyas, there is such simcha, there is such kidusha. When a person accepts his matzav, this is who I am, gegang in weiter. And the this guy after the Badika's chametz points to his wife and says, and when do we sell this piece of chametz? And his wife answers, no problem, my father sold me to a guy a long time ago. Right. Okay. So now, the Gemara says, Kama Tipshoi, how fools are certain people. The, the Kaimi Mikami Sefer Torah, they stand up before a Sefer Torah, but they won't stand up before a Gavra Rabba. And you know how great Sadiqim are? Look, the Torah says you give a guy 40 Malchus, and they went and said it's only 39. So what do they have to do with the other? So we mentioned last time, the 40 days is the 40 days of Matan Torah. So it's from the Sam There's a Borim Yoim of Yitzirah Savla, that an embryo is created. The Rabbani Shem says you were created for a purpose. Every human being was created for a purpose. If there is something, says the Beis Aaron, that you can do, that somebody else can't, then you don't exist, then the Kaj Baruch would have not created you. The Rabbani Shem does not make spare parts. Every single person in this world can do something that nobody else in the world can. You can do something that nobody else in the world can. And that's why it says that if you don't understand that, that every person has a purpose, regardless of how bad he messed up his life. And this is what the tzaddikim saw in a person. And that's why you say you have, to, you have to get up for someone. It says, you know, when they hired, you would think, what was the advertisement to hire those that gave Malchus and Bezin? Right? Muscles, you know, at least 600 pounds, a guy that uh, gets up there. You, you know what you have to be? Chasure kayach, you have to be weak, but very smart. Because the whole purpose was not to whack. The purpose was to direct. The purpose was to teach a person, listen, you, you got to be happy with who you are. Because what you can do, nobody else in the world can. What do they say? There's a baba rolling her stroller. And there's all of a sudden the wind comes, and the Enka little baby is lifted and thrown into the water, and she screams and yells, Rabbi Yisraelim, you can't do this to me, help! And everyone is standing there in shock, and then miraculously this wave shoots up in the air, and the baby flies out into the hands of the grandmother. And then she looks at the baby, and everyone goes, and she says, Rabbi Yisraelim, where's his hat? <laughs> we do that sometimes. Why right, we do it? If we don't have Seichel to understand the Mailas in our life. And that's the Vayakel Moshe. Vayakel Moshe es kola das b'nei Yisrael v'yoymer leyem eila advarim shetziva Hashem lasois oisa. Refers to the Lamed Tes Melachis. Accepting what you're doing during the week is a tikkun of the Lamed Tes Melachis. You know, people always ask me, who are the ones that will metzliach with their kids? I don't know, you know, it's Yat B'Shmai, I understand that. But come on, what's the trick? Trick? I know you marry a rich uh, father-in-law. Come on, come on, come on. 
He says, uh, I, I, I'll tell you what I once heard from an old Rav. I said to him, you've been here for many, many years. Who are the ones who will mitzliach with their kids? He said, could be, it's koid atzmi ani dairish. But I think that those that come to say good Shabbos to the Rav, before they walk out, I think they will mitzliach with their kids. Because you know what he was saying? He was saying, guess what? This is a world where I take orders. This is a world where it's not hefker. We are who we are, and we're looking to be guided. We're looking to be guided. We're not looking for excuses. You know, there was a man, he was a roaring drunk. And his children said to him, you can't, you can't keep, you're embarrassing us. So there has to be some restrictions. He says, give me some restrictions. He said, from now on, you can only drink with the chavrusa. What? You can fill up here a cup like this, okay? A vodka, slivovitz. This is tea, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but you can only drink with a chavrusa. You promise? He says, okay, not bad. They were very smart. They realized he wakes up in the middle of the night, he fills up a cup like this, and they'll go find the chavrusa. He has to walk on the street, and he has to find someone. He has to bring the guy home. He has to have enough schnapps to fill both cups. So that little curb is, will restrict this. So one night he wakes up, he's like, dying for a drink, and it wasn't coffee. So he's roaming the streets, he's looking for some town shikha to bring home. He can't. Only with a chavrusa, only with a chavrusa. So he sits down, he fills up one cup, and the other guy fills up, you know, he fills up another cup. Maybe Abish should help him. Someone's going to walk in. And he's sitting there and he's looking at these cups. He goes, Rabbi Shalom, help. And suddenly he sees bzzz, a fly he lands into one of the cups and he goes, L'chayem! Right? And he says to the fly, here, let me finish the part that you uh, didn't finish. You know, we can, it's very easy to fool ourselves. Very easy to have dreams that aren't there. The Lama Fest Malach is that you do during the week. Your massive is what Hashem assigned you. Look at you all around. You each have a purpose. And by doing that, when Shabbos Kaidish comes and everyone stops doing what he's doing and you get together, that is the tikkun on the chait of Adam Harishan. You are rebuilding the world. The Zoyer says on this Pasik, for whatever reason, <laughs> that here's the Makar to have two loaves, two Lecha Mishnah on Shabbos. What's the union of Lecha Mishnah? So the Zoyer says, normally you see the Sugis and the Sechtis Psachim, things that have an even number is, is vulnerable to the Sitra Achra, to the forces of Tumma, the Zugais, which is the reason everyone always takes the third piece of stuffed cabbage, because you don't want to have Zugais, <laughs> and so on. So the, the two loaves is beyond, when a person is willing to, comes to Shabbos, he says, this is who I am, I don't care what was before Shabbos, what was before, what's going to be after, is going to be after, I'm going to do my best to be happy on Shabbos. That is a tikkun of the luchas shnuas. The two loaves of Shabbos correspond to the two luchas. What was the second luchais? Why was the first luchais broken? The panic of the Chet Ego. Somehow that we did not believe that God is directly involved in what happens. That we didn't understand that. And then there is the tikkun for the Chet Ego is to say, it's all the Rabbi Nishalaylam and Shabbos is Shabbos. It says on Shabbos, so the pre Chaim says, you walk into your house on Shabbos, you should say loud, Shabbos Shalom Umevayrach. Well, that's why we sing Shalom Aleichem. It says if you start singing Shalom Aleichem, and there's something going on in the house and people aren't in such a good mood and you settle it. They said, it's Shabbos. Can we settle it after Shabbos? Fine. Till now we smile at each other. He says, the Malachim are so indebted to you that there's, there's a brach of Shalom Bayis in this house that is beyond imagination, beyond our understanding. Nitekune Zoyer says in this week's parsha. No fire should burn on Shabbos. Why does the Torah single out not to make a fire? The Zoyer says the fire means the fire of anger. If you sequester, and I'll use the word sequester now because people get nervous, <laughs> but if you extinguish the fire of anger on Shabbos, then you should know that you also extinguish the fires of Gehenna. But the Rabbani Shem says, this person didn't allow the fire of anger to burn on Shabbos, no Gehenim has any effect on him. That's like, Sevaru Esh B'chol Meshesechem Yem Shabbos means that Gehenim doesn't burn on Shabbos, says the Zayar. Shlach Kaddish brings it. And like, Sevaru Esh is also, as much as it's important not to get angry during the week, don't get angry on Shabbos. You're not going to get angry and scream at your kid under his chuppah. So the entire Shabbos is, and most normal people won't, but the entire Shabbos is the chuppah, is Kedushas Kasser, says the Sefer Taim Medavira. So Vayakel Moshe says the Ber Moshe, that everything in this world is divided, as we've discussed many times, Oilam Shana Nefesh, person, place, and time. That's the combination of wherever we are at a given moment. 
So Vayakal Moshe, Moshe gathered all the Nishamas, including us, and said, you have the power to smile on Shabbos. Shabbos is time, and Mishkan is the Olam. And therefore, every house could become a Mishkan. The Menorah is the Menorah, the, the candles is the Menorah in the base of Migdash. The, the table is the Chalus of the Lechem upon him. The Svarim Shank is the Aran Kaidesh. And your house is a Mishkan. And if there is an Asayan on Shabbos of anger, of fear, of anxiety, and you do your best, we're only human beings, to bring peace, or at least paint the smile on your face on Shabbos, says the Zayr, you have created the Kedusha of the Mishkan, beyond the imagination. We aren't always Shabbos, where we want to be. And I was in Los Angeles uh, last Shabbos, so I was preparing for Shiurim on Friday, so I was in this uh, uh, guest house that somebody has in his backyard. I was sitting outside, surrounded by palm trees, at 82 degrees, and there was a pool uh, next door, and he also offered me the use of his car, and then, you know, uh, one of my co-workers in Yeshiva calls me and says, everything okay? Because well, I'm working really hard to repair the Shiurim now, you know, like really, you know. I say, no, that's where I cut the job. I could deal with that, you know, but that's not always where you are for Shabbos. I'll never forget that my father, Zachan Levracha, would have to be brought in emergency Friday night. And I was in uh, Cornell University, and I had to find the Bicker Chaylam apartment. When I got there, I finally knocked on the door. You know, there's a signed bed. There was no bed for me as well. You know, sleep on the carpet, you know. And I'm talking to this guy, like, late into the night. He didn't see my face. I didn't see him. And I wound up sleeping on the floor. You know, there was some blanket and a pillow. It was okay. And I wake up in the morning, and he gets up. He gets out of his bed. And he says to me, oh, you're the one that gives the shiurim? I said, yeah. He goes, well, thank you. I said, for the shiurim? He says, no, for not telling me who you are last night, because then I would have to have given you my bed. He says, yeah. hey, sometimes we're surrounded by palm trees, and sometimes we're on the carpet. That's the trick. It's all plotted out. And your trick is like Savaru Eish Bachal Mashur Seichem B'Yayim HaShabbos. To be able to stay happy on Shabbos, it is not easy. The Gemara tells us, Maisa Bachal Sadechad, he went for a walk, Shabbos afternoon on his field, and he found a gaping hole in his gate. Those learning that he just learned it. I think Babli doesn't say he went for a walk, but in the Yishalmi it says he went for a walk, and went for a Tiyul it says, and he decided how to fix it, and he said, Oh no, oh no, a hole in my gate, a breach in my security, alarm! No, no. Shabbos. Forget about it. And even though he had a great plan how to fix it, he decided after Shabbos that he's not going to fix it. So what happened as a result? A beautiful slough tree, a caper bush, grew in, and he had parnasasa, parnasas anche basically was able to draw sustenance. He was draw parnasa for him and for his family. For Mara says, I guess unlimited. Okay, so there's an amazing miiri. The Meiri says that if you forget about your tzaras on Shabbos, mekoimoy muskerloy, look it up. Your place is rented to you. What does that mean your place is rented to you? What does that mean your place is rented to you? Can anyone suggest anything? Uh, those, I don't want to mean to wake anyone up here, but uh, <laughs> what does the Meiri mean when he says mekoimoy muskerloy, your place is rented to you? What does that possibly mean? So I was asking around, and someone, someone offered this, and I think this is real. He says there are times we can lose our parnas. We can lose what HaKadosh Baruch Hu prepared for us. And because uh, Baruch Hu gave us a pranah, so we botched it. You know, we just, we weren't happy with it, and we were angry, you know, wanted to find it, take it away. So what does Hashem do? Hashem says, I'll give you an assign on Shabbos. Comes a test on Shabbos! Ay, ay, I'm so scared, I'm so worried, I don't know what's going to be! And we have the courage to say, okay, it's Shabbos, it's Shabbos, I'm not thinking about it. Hashem says, give it back to him. The Malachim say... But, but, but we took it away from him. There's a whole gzera. Shem says, lease it to him. Okay? Now, as you know, sometimes leased cars are nicer than owned ones. Right? <laughs> God leases to you what you may have lost. Even if it was Bashet Chazashom that you lost your parnasa, you lost your home, you lost that shidduch, you lost that something, through Mesiris Nefesh and Shabbos, Hashem leases it to you. This person had a breach in his wall. It was Bashet, everything should be gone. He had the courage to say, I'm not thinking about it on Shabbos. So it's laugh grows in. I'm leasing you the area. It's growing on your territory. You have your panasa from a total outside source. It says, who was this person? He was a, a Gilgal of the Mekai Shishetzim. Remember the Mekai Shishetzim? He's the one that, as a Mechalek is what he did. Rabbi Kiva holds, who was the Mekai Shishetzim? Tzalachad. So Tzalaf is Tzalaf Chad. He was the one Tzalaf Chad. Says the Ben Yayada. 
And what was the Makosh Eitz? And Moshe Rabbeinu comes up to Shemayim, he finds the Makosh Eitz in Gan Eden. What's he doing here? He chopped wood on Shabbos. He's the first one that got Misa for being Mechal Shabbos. He did so L'Shem Shemayim. Because he was scared people are going to say, hey, we're not going to Eretz Yisrael, forget Shabbos. He wanted to show us how serious Shabbos is. But he still shouldn't have done it. Because you don't give, you be Shemayim Shabbos. Don't worry about the future. Let Hashem worry about Shabbos. You worry about your Shabbos. Hashem will worry about His. I heard from uh, um, Rav Yitzhak Meir Shorzal Zayin Kizun said, told me, I think, from his father. What does it mean that Kosh is Mezavek Zuvugim? Kosh Baruch Hu makes Shidduchim. The best Shabbos in the world can figure out that this 22-year-old boy and this 19-year-old girl are a perfect match. But we, we have tunnel vision. We only see till the first stop sign. Do we know what's going to be when he's in his 30s, she's in her 20s? Do we know what's going to be when, she, when he's in his 50s and she's in her 40s? When he's in his 70s and she's in her 60s? Are they still going to be a good shidduch? Only a Kaddish Baruch Hu knows what's going to happen in the course of their lives. So when it says that Kaddish Baruch Hu is mezavik zivugim, it's the same zivuk that's constantly being redone. A Kaddish Baruch Hu sees the whole picture from beginning to end, all the way through the beginning. We have very limited sight. But what we do know is when there's Mesiris Nefesh for Simcha and Shabbos, Hashem says, okay, the rest is up to me. I, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it. Mar muskaloi. You lost your panasa, at least you knew panasa. It's no problem, even if you don't deserve it. There's ways around contracts. So I want to conclude with this story. There was Reb Tzemach Tzerafasi. I think that's how you pronounce it. Tzerafasi, I guess, from Tzerafat is France. And Reb Tzemach was once very sick. He was the Rav in Tunis. He was very, very sick. And he had a dream that if he'll be up the night of a bris, uh, when babies have a bris, that he'll have a refu shalayim, that's the liyah, you know, he told him. So in Tunis, he used to go with his whole chavariah, every time there was a baby born, a baby boy that was born, he was up the entire night learning. So I told this to somebody, he said, oh, when somebody came and said the baby boy was born, he probably went, oh, no. I said, he didn't go, oh, no, because the liyah, you know, he doesn't come to such people. He went, oh, great. So that's, some say that's a lot of the makar for the vachnach and things that people do the night before the bris to be up the entire night. Well anyway, the story goes, he was a tremendous masmid, and he sat down to learn one night, and as he's learning, puff, out goes his candle. And there was no breaker downstairs in the basement that you could turn on. So he walks outside in the freezing cold, and he's trying to figure out where he can get a fire at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, well, the guy that, uh, they locked him up for 50 years, and they said, what do you want? He said, I want, you know... 3,000 packs of cigarettes and I'll be okay. And they, they lock him in, and you know, after 50 years he comes out, they say, No, how do you feel? He goes, Anyone have a match? Right? <laughs> okay. So he's looking 3 o'clock in the morning, he's looking for a match. So he passes the baker's house, and the oven is burning a whole night, he knows that, so it should be ready in the morning. There's a guy sleeping upstairs. Can I wake a guy up 3 o'clock in the morning? He bangs on the door, and this poor guy, kid, comes down. He goes, Rabbi, this is a huge beam. i got to lift. I've got to open the door. He says, please. It's like, I have no oxygen. I have no time. And he lifts the beam, drops it on his bare feet. I added that part. But uh, whatever it was, easy. He gives him the fire. He walks home. And as soon as he gets home, puff, it goes out. <laughs> and he walks back. And this is, by now the guy's sleeping. He's dreaming about palm trees in Los Angeles. It's strange. He hears the palm trees saying, wake up, wake up, I need a fire. No, no, I'm cutting you down. Where's Haman, you know? No, no, no. And he comes back downstairs again, you know, please. The fire went on, he lifts the beam, and he opens up, lights the fire. This time he covers himself the blankets, and he's flying in the clouds, dreaming away, and all of a sudden the clouds go, no, wake up, wake up, the fire went out. He's blowing the clouds away, no, and he gets out. He goes, Rabbi, you know, happy this beam, this is the third time tonight. He says, listen to me. Whatever weight this beam is, you'll have that amount in gold. Here he is. Okay, got ya. And uh, shortly thereafter, as the story goes, he's walking and he's passing a tree. And uh, this guy in a trench coat, I'm also adding this, you know, with a little trimmings over here, we're just adding on. But uh, says, Psst. he says, you want to make a lot of money? He says, I'll give you X amount per dollar, like 10 times the minimum wage you're making in the bakery. Follow me, puts a blindfold around his face. He says, you can't look. Of course, the guy's peeking. He says, you're looking? Nope, 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 nope. I don't know you're not looking. He says, I'll show you. I'm even crashing into this pole. You want to see? <laughs> Boom. See, I'm not looking? Okay. That's the perfect part of the story. All right. Anyway, he takes him to a palace, and he says, this is all my gold over here in coins. I want you to line up the hundreds and the fifties and the tens. And, the... and he does that for a couple of weeks. And then a couple of weeks later, he hears a guy died. He left some old palace in the woods, and the government is auctioning it off. And to make a long story short, he makes sure to bid on that auction the way he should. Takes the money, he knows they're going to grab it away from him, runs for it, goes to Istanbul, starts a whole big business. And again, Reb Tzemach Tzarafsi, later on in his life, and is in his high 
90s, he goes to Eretz Yisrael, to be Nifter in Eretz Yisrael, as was the custom in those days. And uh, in Istanbul, he runs out of money, and he can't get onto the ship, and he's in trouble, and he sees this huge minister walking with a bunch of people around him, and they, he runs over, and he hugs him, he says, Rabina, Rabbi, you don't remember who I am, because of you, I'm the one who lifted the beam. Anyway, not only he sends him to Eretz Yisrael, he winds up supporting him for the rest of his life. So they did some of Rabbi Tzemach Tzeravs, he says, come on, what did the guy do? He lifted a beam a few times, you know? He said, you don't know what it means when you're not in the mood of doing something. And you continue to, and you say, this is my matzif, I'm going to do it. And it really goes back to Rav Tzemach as well. You know, the light went out, forget it, go back to sleep. You don't know what it means when you're not in the mood of turning on the light. And you say, Yom Tev is coming, and Pesach is coming, and I simply have to go on. And that courage to lift the beam, when the beam in life is very heavy to go on, is bound, is bound to bring results. Where even if you're going to say, I'm lost, I lost everything, you may be right. But the Rav has an awful lot that he's willing to lease to you. Yeah.